group of people that's a little bit peripheral when we think of uh, Jerusalem as a holy city. They're not a dominant group. They're a very small group from very far away. Not too far away, but far enough. Mm. Uh, actually, the previous speaker mentioned them uh, when she mentioned the Assyrians, the Armenians, and various non-Arab Christian groups. Obviously, since... Um, Jerusalem is a holy city for the three Abrahamic faiths. Well, the Assyrians being one of the Christian groups of the Middle East, a very ancient, a very indigenous Christian group, um, they also viewed uh, Jerusalem as a holy place and it's a very important part of their religious culture. So, where do I... Maybe I should just do this. Yes. Let me see. Okay, that works. <laughs> okay, so in the northeast Syrian town of Tel Tamar stands, uh, stands, an, uh, stands an Assyrian church with an unusual name called Kaddishta in the Aramaic language, meaning the female saint or the holy one Many of those who visited to worship just assume that it's dedicated to the Virgin Mary or some other unknown, forgotten, or unnamed holy woman. Rather, it is an abbreviation of the full name, which is the Holy Church of Our Lord's Tomb, with the adjective holy, Kaddishta, referring to the feminine noun, church. Built in 1986, it is the only active church belonging to the Church of the East in the whole world to bear this unusual name. Its previous namesakes, uh, or we should say reincarnations, were built in 1935, also in Tamar, and in 1925 at the village of Kavlasin in northern Iraq whereas the original church, consecrated in 1818, still stands in ruins in, uh, in the village where it was first built, the village of Qalayatha in southeast Turkey's mountainous Hakkari province. And you can see where the inhabitants, the original inhabitants of, of the village of Qalayatha, who were forced out of Turkey after, the 19, uh, after 1915 and then 1924, uh, ended up in a refugee camp in Iraq, then they were resettled in Kavlasin until 1933 when the Iraqi government massacred 3,000 Assyrians and then they fled to Tel Tamar in Syria where they built the church for the third time. So, uh, its name also appears in the dedications of about 10 manuscripts dated between 1820 and 1920 that once formed the church's library and are now kept in the home of its traditional caretakers. In these, we also observe that the church was known under the names, under other names, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre of Our Lord and the Holy Church of the Second Jerusalem and also simply the Holy Church of Jerusalem. But why is this the only dedication of its kind in the Assyrian Church of the East, and how did this unusual name come into being? The answer to this lies in the Church's tradition of sacred travel to the Holy Land and the procural of blessings from the sacred sites in Jerusalem and its environs. While there is still a West Assyrian or Syriac Orthodox presence in Jerusalem, and the Syriac Orthodox Church is still part of the status quo at the major Christian shrines in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. The marked absence of Eastern Assyrians, largely represented by the Church of the East, is quite telling. This has not always been the case, however, uh, and the Church was quite well, well represented in Jerusalem and the Holy Land prior to its disintegration and being written out of the status quo since the mid-18th century until it was finally formalized in 1853. Now, this paper will explore the importance of pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the tradition of the Church of the East, 
its historical presence in the Holy City, and how it came to an end in the midst of the Chaldean Catholic Schism, um, which strategically tore the Church apart at its core between the 16th and 19th centuries, leading to its irreversible decline as an international religious institution. Just the, juxtaposed against this historical narrative, a parallel history of personal pilgrimage and vernacular religious expression will be gleaned from uh, manuscript colophons, church registries, oral accounts, and tombstone epitaphs, in addition to the story of how the Qadishta church was founded. So, firstly, I'm going to talk about Jerusalem and its link to sainthood, or to becoming a saint in the tradition of the Church of the East. Now, even before the Assyrians' conversion to Christianity, sorry, I'm just going to skip a few slides. I just realized I skipped them. <laughs> so even before the Assyrians' conversion to Christianity, Jerusalem was an important place of pilgrimage for the Jews who lived in their midst. According to the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament, they were Mesopotamian, Persian, Parthian, and Median pilgrims in Jerusalem for the festival of Shavuot, who were among the very first Christian converts at Pentecost. These are also traditionally credited with having spread the good news in the Persian Empire. Now, this is where the Church of the East began to form by the 3rd century. As such, the adherents of this church began to view Jerusalem as the ultimate destination for sacred journeys of pilgrimage, as well as visits to places associated with the life of Jesus Christ. However, it, not only did this have a personal dimension, uh, it also became a common literary motif in uh, hagiographies from the 5th century onward. So, uh, the genre of... So, this is just a map showing you where the Church of the East was forming, mostly to the east of the Roman Empire in what was the Persian Empire. Okay. So... Hagiography is a genre of saints' lives, and it emerged as a literary form to commemorate Christian figures that were understood as perfect followers of Christ, with their lives being seen and promoted as models of holiness and as examples to follow. Thus, saints indeed have a powerful presence within Christian culture, including that of the Church of the East. The pattern of saintly pilgrims' travel followed by the founding of a monastery, therefore, has many examples in late antique Syriac hagiographies. Such texts frequently mention travel and pilgrimage to the holy places in Palestine, as well as Sinai and Egypt. And this motif even served as the axis around which certain saints' lives were composed. Consequently, it had come to be seen as an almost vital component in the formation of a saintly hero's identity and as an act of ascetic renunciation in itself. The lives of at least 16 saints who reputedly lived between the 3rd and 8th centuries are thus replete with accounts of personal journeys made to the holy places in Jerusalem prior to their return to various places in the East to found monasteries, churches, and religious schools. At least, um, at least three of these accounts relate to saints who are believed to have been disciples of the famous 4th century ascetic figure, Saint Eugene, uh, who was originally Egyptian. And this is a fact which may be linked to the importance of the monastery that he founded on Mount Isla, near uh, Turkey's border with Syria, uh, and it is regarded in East Assyrian tradition as a second Jerusalem and a necessary stop for pilgrims on their sacred journey to the Holy City. Nevertheless, these narratives reflect uh, the founding of monastic establishments after pilgrimage to Jerusalem, marking the final stage uh, in um, in the long process of shaping a saint's image, institutionalizing their authority in the local society. Furthermore, they are grounded in the local sacred tradition, 
reflecting the magnetism of the holy places in Palestine and their competition with local Assyrian sacred sites. Indeed, the motif of the monk pilgrim establishing a monastery after returning home was not a pure fabrication of hagiographers looking to enhance the sacred territory of their saintly hero. Pilgrimage had grown to become an almost obligatory act of piety in monastic culture and a mark of religious identity within the Church of the East. So, a little bit about the community in Jerusalem that belonged to the Church of the East. The, uh, an East Assyrian community is first mentioned in Jerusalem in the 7th century, and the city was the seat of a Church of the East bishop and a metropolitan as late as the 13th century. In 1346, the church possessed a chapel dedicated to the parting of the raiment in the ambulatory behind the apse of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, the community seems to have lost its privileges by 1516, and by the end of the 16th century, their chapel was in the hands of the Armenians. This can partially be blamed on the schism that split the church apart in 1552 and the subsequent rivalry between the two parties, the Catholic Chaldeans on one side and the traditionalist Nestorians, quote-unquote, on the other. Nevertheless, the holy city remained an important place of pilgrimage for both rival factions. Notes have survived of the visit of two groups of East Assyrian pilgrims in the second half of the 16th century. One of Catholic pilgrims and another of traditionalists. The status of the East Assyrians was restored around the middle of the 16th century by Catholic convert Elia Asmar Habib, who had bought a hospice in Jerusalem for the use of, of pilgrims shortly before his consecration as Metropolitan of Diyarbakir in 1554. He had also persuaded Ottoman authorities to provide a chapel uh, to the north of the Holy Sepulchre dedicated to St. Mary Magdalene for the use of the Chaldeans. Elia Asmar Habib uh, presumably intended these for the use of Catholic converts, but neither site remained in Catholic hands for long. By 1610, the chapel was claimed by the traditionalist patriarch, and it is not mentioned after 1614. And in 1697, it had been abandoned. The hospice, on the other hand, should probably be identified with the monastery and church of the Virgin Mary, first mentioned in 1576. By 1581, it had been appropriated by a rich East Assyrian woman, and it remained the main center uh, for traditionalist East Assyrians in Jerusalem into the 18th century. The monastery and church are not mentioned after 1728, and it is not clear when and why the East Assyrian community in Jerusalem disappeared. So after 1750, roughly, we no longer hear of the Church of the East or the Chaldean Catholic Church in Jerusalem. So I'm going to move on now to pilgrims from Assyria and Mesopotamia. Now, in order to obtain a better picture, not just of the presence of East Assyrians in Jerusalem, but also of the average pilgrim's profile, a number of sources have been consulted for this study. Among them are manuscript colophons, notes made in such manuscripts, travelers' reports, family histories, oral accounts, tombstone inscriptions from the Urmia region in Iran, and the Chaldean Catholic Church's registries in the cities of Mardin and Diyarbakir in Turkey. The material ranges between the years 1536 and 1970, and the names of 465 individual pilgrims have been gleaned from it. Presumably, the vast majority of these were East Assyrians, either from the Church of the East or the Chaldean Catholic Church, with at least two from the 19th century, having been evangelical Presbyterians who were Assyrians from Urmia. So, in the 16th century, 
we find the names of a total of 25 pilgrims, 16 of whom belonged to the Church of the East, and 9 of whom were Catholics. In the 17th century, we glean the names of 22 pilgrims, of whom 17 were from the Church of the East. And of the 23 pilgrims' names from the, 19th, uh, from the 18th century, sorry, 14 adhered to the Church of the East. So we see a majority of pilgrims during this time were still from the traditionalist fact, uh, faction. So during this time, as noted earlier, the traditionalist Church of the East was, for the most part, in control of the East Assyrian religious sites in the Holy Land. However, in the 19th century, this changed. Uh, in 287 out of 329 pilgrims that we find in the records were Chaldean Catholics. Uh, as were 65 out of 67 from the 20th century until 1970. This evidence coincides with the success of the Catholic faction in converting the Church of the East's traditionalist patriarchate after 1804 and its subsequent absorption of the East Assyrian population from the major cities as well as those from large towns and villages in the plains around them. So during this time, the Church of the East became limited to its poorer adherents in the more remote highlands of Hakkari and Urmia, which are now in southeastern Turkey and northwest Iran. Geographically speaking, the pilgrims hailed from a total of 70 separate locations, most of which are located in northern Mesopotamia and historic Assyria. Of these, 185 pilgrims found in the records came from the city of Mardin and six villages around it, in the region around it. So here you can see basically this whole North Mesopotamia historic Assyria region. So um, 185 came from the city of Mardin and six villages in the region around it, as well as 139 from Diyarbakir and three of its surrounding villages. Now another 53, almost all from the 19th century and early 20th centuries, hailed from Urmia in Iran and 25 of its surrounding villages, uh, particularly those of the wealthy Nazlu River district, from which we find a total of 32 pilgrims. A total of 14 pilgrims came from the city of Mosul, or Nineveh, with another 21 from seven of its villages, particularly uh, the major centers of Tilkepe and al Qush, where the Patriarchate of the Church of the East was for 300 years as well as places such as Kirkuk and Shaklawa, which are further to the east. Another 39 originated from 12 towns and villages in the districts of Gazarta, Botan, and Sirt. And finally, in the roughly three centuries between 1601 and 1907, we only find 10 pilgrims from, the nine, from nine villages of the remote Hakari region, four of whom were from a district called Shamstinan. Furthermore, it comes as no surprise that about 118 of these pilgrims uh, either had ecclesiastical ranks, otherwise served the church, or were related to such people. On the other hand, pilgrims also came from notable families, bearing the title Khawaja, or Master, or Mukhtar, meaning a secular community leader. Another phenomenon that we witness in the records consulted is the continuation of the practice of pilgrimage to Jerusalem by members of the same family. At least 18 pilgrims that we find were also the sons of pilgrims. And in at, le in at least one case, both father and son are known to have made the pilgrimage together. While in another case, two of the pilgrims were brothers. Pairs of pilgrims who were brothers can also be, be found in three other cases. In another outstanding case, this one from Diyarbakir, there were three pilgrims in three generations of the same family. So one pilgrim from each generation. From the Mardin registries, we can ascertain that many pilgrims completed their sacred travels during early adulthood, with one becoming a pilgrim by the age of 19 and another by the age of 29. We also notice that at least another eight of the 168 male pilgrims mentioned had attained their status prior to being married. So it seems to be something that people did 
before getting married, almost like a rite of passage. Furthermore, we find the name Qudsi or Qudsiya, Jerusalemite, which was given by pilgrims to their first child born after making pilgrimage in two records. Undoubtedly, pilgrims who had returned from uh, the Holy Land and their family members were held in high regard uh, by the communities in which they lived. Many of them, even without holding an ecclesiastical rank or being involved in the church, were chosen as godparents for newly baptized children or to witness weddings. Finally, a total of 10 women, 10 female pilgrims to Jerusalem are known, and they only appear in the 19th century, with almost all of them found in the period from 9, uh, 1850 to 1950. So it seems to be something more recent as um, security improved during the second half of the 19th century. It should be noted that uh, those men who attained the status of pilgrim were also styled by the Syriac word Makadshaya, one from the holy places, or the Arab equivalent Makdisi, which is found in the colloquial forms Maqsi in Mardin and Diyarbakir or Muqdusi in Iran. Women, on the other hand, bore the feminine versions of these titles. A number of Assyrian clans and families, uh, especially in Iraq's Nineveh Plain, bear this name, Maqdisi. It is also possible that pilgrims to Jerusalem may have also been styled with the Arabic term Hajji, pilgrim, and there are also families with such names in Iraq. In Iran, on the other hand, Assyrian families descended from people who completed the pilgrimage to Jerusalem bear the Persian surname Mohaddas or Mohaddas Nia. Now, my conclusion and coming to the start of the presentation, the, the Qaddishta church. Now, in the context of the above history and traditions of pilgrimage, we return to the church of Qaddishta and the legend of its founding. Now, sparked by a local feud with the rival caretaker of the nearest church, there being no church in his native village of Kalayatha, a man named Chayel set out for Jerusalem to pray for a solution to his problem and a sign from God. Upon reaching, the, upon reaching his final destination, he found himself being barred from entering the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Unswayed, Chayel went to the nearest rubbish heap, soiled his face and clothes, tearing them apart and putting feathers in his hair, and then he returned to the church gate, pretending to be a madman. Abused at his state, the guards allowed him entry, as, and as he prayed at Christ's tomb, he noticed a small stone glowing on it. This he took as the sign that he had wished for, so he promptly placed the stone under his tongue and traveled back home. There, he and his family kept this sign for 123 years in a small chapel they had built in order to house it. Until an angel appeared in a dream to his descendant, also named Chayel, urging him to build a church in which to put this relic. He complied with the angel's wishes, and the church was consecrated in 1818 by the patriarch himself, so the, the head of the church. For the next 106 years, the church of Qaddishta served as a substitute for those unable to undertake the arduous and expensive journey to Jerusalem. The new church in Tal Tamar, where the relic is now kept, serves the same purpose for the Assyrians today. This has especially been since 1948, after which Syria has been in a constant state of war with Israel. Being Syrian citizens, the Assyrians are not allowed to visit the holy city and related sites, so they have to be thus contented by just visiting the humble church of Qaddishta in Tal Tamar. Thank you very much.